dollar? Change? No, I'm sorry, I don't. Oh. Well, uh, could you do me a favor and watch my stuff here while I go break a dollar? Of course. Thanks. Hey, I guess they're right. Senior citizens, although slow and dangerous behind the wheel, can still serve a purpose. I'll be right back. Don't you go dying on me! Where's the booze? I got robbed by a sweet old lady on a motorized cart. I didn't even see it coming. Oh. So we've been in this series uh, called uh, "Didn't Even S Didn't Didn't See It Coming," and uh, what I've been plowing through over the course of the last uh, few weeks are these uh, things that can kind of sneak up on us in our lives that uh, you wouldn't think would sneak up on us on a, in our lives, but then they do sneak up on us in our lives, and and in the spirit of we we didn't even see it coming. And so uh, this morning the. Uh, the item that I want to address that I'm going to suggest to you sneaks up on us in our lives that we may not see coming is, uh, is the issue of compromise. Compromise. The, uh, it's the uh, sneak up right on you when, you when you didn't even see it coming. All right. Um, well, if you're um, a guy like me in a setting like this, and you want to say to good people like you in a setting like this that uh, we want to have greater degrees of, of uh, clarity in our lives. One of the things that guys like me will recommend to good people like you is that uh, clarity can come uh, by us reading, reading and interacting with, with the Bible. All right, so this is, a, this is a Bible sermon. Happy Thanksgiving. It's a Bible sermon. Happy, happy Thanksgiving. Interacting with the Bible. Um, there's, there's compromise in our lives when our lives are kind of cloudy or unclear. And so a lot of what will happen when you sit in settings like this and listen to people like me talk to you about how you can eliminate compromise from your life and instigate clarity in your life by interacting with uh, the Bible. And then what guys like me, we'll do four people, two people like you, and things like this, is we'll, we'll hold forward Bible passages for you that in theory will, will really motivate you to interacting with your Bible, you know, to make things more clear and to make your life less compromised. Let me, let me, show, you how, let me show you how I would do that in a setting like this if I were, if I were to do it. So, okay, everybody, everybody have your Bibles. I'm going to pull those bad boys out and, and turn to uh, Matthew chapter 7. I, I want to read this passage to you, Matthew chapter 7. This is a good verse on reading your Bible for eliminating compromise and increasing clarity in uh, your relationship with Jesus. I, I, here, listen to this passage. Uh, it's a good one. Uh, Matthew 7, starting in verse 24. Jesus says, Therefore, if everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, those people, like a, a wise man who built his house on a rock, the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it didn't fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The same rains came, the same streams rose, the same winds blew, beat against the house of their life, and because they didn't take these words of mine and do them, their house, their life, fell with a mighty crash. And so that's where people like me look at people like you and say, this is Jesus, he's... He's ending out the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon of all time. Starts it with, with the Beatitudes, the blesseds are, and then he moves into some teaching on righteousness and how our righteousness has to 
be at a certain place so that we can participate in the life of God and how he does some work on anger and murder and how he does some work on lust and adultery and he talks about our yes being yes and our no being no and the o's that we tend to and and uh, and he talks about uh, uh, the kinds of religious and um, spiritual disciplines we can engage with prayer and fasting and and giving to the poor and how we need to not worry about what's going to happen in our lives that god tends to our lives just like he tends to the birds of the air just like he tends to the beasts of the field it's just like he cares for all of them. And who of you, by worrying, can add a single day to your life? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything will be added unto you. And be careful about your judgments. Ask, seek, knock, enter through the narrow gate, for broad is the gate, wide is the road that leads to destruction. Everybody finds that one, but to find the road and the gate that leads to life, it, that's narrow, that's harder to find. And so... You should take these words of mine, and you should heed them, and you'd be like a wise person who builds their life on a rock so that when all hell breaks loose, your life will prevail, unlike the dullard who lives down the road from you, who ignores my words, does not do them, and when all hell breaks loose in their life, their life falls apart. Do you see how clear that is? Man, I need to go get myself a batch of Jesus' words. I need to listen to what he has to say. I need to, get, get, I'll, show, I'll show you another one. I'll, I'll do it again, get, uh, just to show you how skilled I am at this. Um, John chapter 6, I'm in verse 63. One verse this time, Jesus again speaking. He says, John 6, 63, the spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing the words that i have spoken to you those words are full of spirit and life his words are not just dogma and law dogma being what you're supposed to believe even though you don't really want to believe it law telling you what you're supposed to do even though you don't really want to do it. That's how many people understand Christianity. Believing what you're supposed to believe even if you don't want to believe it and doing what you're supposed to do even though you really don't want to do it. Dogma and law. Jesus says his words transcend dogma and law. His words are not dogma and law. His words, if you would come to know them and savor them and love them and obey them and integrate them and engage his words are not dogma and law his words are spirit and life they carry a kind of vitality a kind of insight a kind of power that if you would engage those words will change your life you see how clear that was clear in like 120 seconds clear uh, i'll give you another one i'm in psalm nine, uh, 19 psalm 19 one of my favorite psalms i read this to you not long ago read it to you again today psalm 19 i'm starting in verse 7 the whole psalm is worth you reading up we're we're on clarity we're doing away with compromise here, here here's here's all right psalm 19 7 so the law of the lord is perfect refreshing the soul the statutes of the lord are trustworthy making wise the simple the precepts of the lord are right giving joy to the heart the commands of the lord are radiant giving light to the eyes the fear of the lord is pure enduring forever the decrees of the lord are firm and all of them are righteous these things his commands his words his precepts his laws these things are more precious than gold any old kind of gold no no not any old gold much pure gold and they are sweeter than honey just any kind of honey no honey that comes straight off the comb by them words commands precepts by these things you are warned and in keeping them 
There is enormous reward, reward, so that when all hell breaks loose in your life, your life will be able to prevail because you've taken the words and the commands and the precepts and the insights of Jesus and the scriptures and you've integrated them into your life and, and they're sweeter than their, their spirit and life. They're not just dogma and law. They're, they're of greater value than gold. They're, they're sweeter than honey off the comb. They're, you should run right out of here and you should read your Bibles and I'm telling you, you should dive in on that because if you'll read your Bibles, you'll have so much more clarity in your spiritual Christian life and you'll be able to obey him, you'll be able to love him. And, uh, well, using these passages, you, you, could, you could see how a person could make a, a compelling argument that you can be less compromised and more clear in, in your life and in your devotion to the Lord by leaning in on his words. Well, well I've, the Bible does say that, but that isn't all the Bible says. So, uh, so I'm going to give you the other, the other part now. Okay, so here's the other part. This is the part that those of you that have been around Godville and the weekly meeting of this little club here, uh, you, you know this if you've tried any of this at all. Uh, the rest of you, you may suspect some of this. Maybe you haven't had anybody out here, but I'll just, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll give you a little bit of the bad news. Okay, so here's the bad news. Um, so say, this, say this just as a heads up uh, about the Bible. Um, Letter one, I don't know if you know this or not, but the assembly of the order of the books in the Bible is not in chronological order. Did you know this? So if when you pick up your Bible, like I'm going to say to you, you need to go read your Bible so you get clarity. Uh, you walk out of here and go, okay, I'm going to go read my Bible. Um, just so you know ahead of time, your Bible isn't constructed in a chronological way. It's reasonable for you to think that your Bible would be constructed in that way, but, but it's, it's not. And so because of that, sometimes what happens when you get into reading the Bible is it can be, become a little bit confusing. What's more than that? As you lean into the Old Testament, what you'll find is that the Old Testament uh, has some components to it that are a little bit uh, confusing in order to kind of hang with it. it um, there's, there's storylines that you're not exactly sure uh, what to do with. There's, there's tribes, and there's, and there's nations, and there's Israel, and there's Judah, and there's kings, and there's prophets. And, it, and there's just, they've, it's got some language and some offices in it that are important that we don't really have and we don't really use in our day-to-day -day life. And so when you kind of get into the story and you start reading it, it's, it's, uh, it's not a simple story to piece together as you're simply just reading the Bible through. And some of that is because it's not in chronological order. And because of that, sometimes you'll end up reading books in the Bible, if you've ever done a Bible read through, you'll end up reading books in the Bible that you're not even sure where they go. So everybody loves the story of Esther. The story of Esther is a great story. The story where for such a time as this, and that's like you got that, you may even have that verse hanging on the wall of your house. But if I was to ask you, where does Esther fall in the chronology of the story of the Israelites? In case y'all, for those of you that don't go to church, that's where good church-going folk head for the dark corners of the room because they're not exactly sure. Like, they're all for Esther. They're glad Esther's in the Bible. But if you asked us to put Esther where Esther goes in the story, that part's a little bit confusing. That happens with Ruth. That happens with Jonah. That happens with Zephaniah. That happens even with Ezekiel and Isaiah. And we're not exactly sure what to do with the kings. So what we do is... We just lop off the Old Testament and we say, I ain't going to mess with that. That's just too complicated. I'm going to focus on something much easier, much more simple, much more straightforward. I'm going to interact uh, with Jesus and the New Testament because that's way easier, way more simple, way more straightforward. And when people say that to me, I just take that as a cue that there's somebody that hasn't ever read much of Jesus because there is nothing simple or easy about Jesus. He talks in all of this double talk. 
first is last. Last is first. Losing is finding. Finding is losing. Dying is living. Living is dying. He's got these paradoxes that he uses. He he talks in in parables. He tells these stories. Uh, The little phraseology they told me when I was in school is that parables are earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. I'll give you an example of an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Here's one that he told. This is found in Matthew chapter 13. It's about three verses long. The story goes like this. And the kingdom of heaven is like a man who found a treasure hidden in a field. And he reburies the treasure. And in his joy, he goes and sells everything that he has. He comes back and he purchases the field in which the treasure resides. Now, let me ask you this. In the story, that's a parable. Who is the treasure in the field? Is the treasure in the field God coming and looking for you? Or is the treasure in the field you coming and looking for God? People like me can't even agree on this. It's just a simple little story, right? He's just so simple. He's just so easy to understand. He, I just, I'm going to lop off the whole Old Testament because that's very confusing. I'm going to lean on the New Testament because that's very clear and very straightforward. That's Jesus. He's the easiest ever to understand. It's, except when you really start to read him, he's actually not all that easy to understand. He's, he's a fairly complicated, extremely brilliant man. Most brilliant man who ever lived. In fact, he even says that he intends to some to be complicated. To some, he doesn't even want you to understand him. Well, that wasn't exactly what I was hoping for. And I'll make matters even a little more challenging than that. The four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all have these differences in them that can be challenging to you. Like, you can sit there and say, okay, so Matthew saw what the story one way, and Mark, well, he wasn't necessarily there, but he hung out with Peter, and he was writing down what Peter said, and so Mark's interacting, telling Peter's story, and Luke is, uh, is uh, interacting, he's t- kind of telling Paul's story and interacting with Paul. You know, P- Paul wasn't actually there, but Paul was an apostle, and so he's, he's assembled this story a bunch of, and John, John's nothing like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you read the four of them, John is nothing like the other three. The other three feel like they kind of interacted with each other when they were written. We're not exactly sure how. Guys like me, we can't even agree on which one of the three was written first. But somebody was using something as they were writing these things together. So when you read the Gospels, they turn in this complicated. They're like they'll have the same stories in them. But they're not always the same reactions and the same people. And it's, it's, it can become relatively complicated. And, and then you start to read what happens after he resurrects and this church is built. And then these people start going on these trips into all of these different towns. And you don't know where these towns are and you don't know how the, what's happening in the towns. And there's all these phenomenal things that are happening when people go to church and they're giving stuff away and they're selling stuff and there's fire falling from heaven. And uh, you hadn't seen any of that when you, when you went to church and since. And we haven't even got to the book of Revelation yet. Which is always funny to me when you sit around with a bunch of longtime Christians who aren't sure what Bible study to do anymore. And invariably someone says, well, what should we start studying? What should we do next to? And somebody will invariably say, we should study Revelation. There's no S on it. Just sing Revelation. And you know, we should study Revelation. Cause, you know, like, cause it's like what we study when we think we've studied everything else there is to study. Ken, that sounds complicated too. Yeah, you already know that it's complicated. So what we end up doing then is we end up sort of paring the whole thing down. And we just go, I'll tell you what, okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say John 3, 16. I'm going to say I believe that about the Bible. God so loved the world, gave his only son. Whosoever believes in him, not perish, have everlasting life. And then I'm going to hang my hat on forgiveness. I'm going to say God's forgiving. So God loves us. God forgives us, that's 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins, to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So he loves, he forgives, and then we get real judgmental about judgment. 
which we have to get really judgmental about judgment because for the framework that we're using with Christianity, love and forgiveness, then anybody who judges, we, so we cherry pick a few verses about judgment. The Bible's teaching on judgment is actually very complicated. But we just sort of say, good, good, good. Nobody gets to judge. And then we just hope when we die, we get to go to heaven and then God will sort it all out there. When that's the approach we take, we find our lives extraordinarily compromised. You know, just because you don't know what the Bible says doesn't mean that you will not be held accountable for what the Bible says. You don't get to stand before the Lord. You just say, I didn't know that. There are people in the world who may get to do that. Look at where you are. You are, you are not one of those people. So the compromise and the lack of clarity of your life is something that you actually can and should tend to. And so uh, what I'm doing, uh, what I'm initiating at our cute little church here over the course of 2019 is to lean in and encourage and invite you to, to spend 2019 reading your Bibles. And I want you to read your Bibles and interact with your Bibles, not just as a rote exercise of, you know, daily legalistic assignment or weekly legalistic assignment. I want you to interact with your Bibles because when you read your Bible and you interact with your Bible, strange and important things actually start to happen in your life. The Lord starts to sneak up on you. And when you don't interact with your Bible, then compromise will just sort of start to set in in ways that, that you may not even think that it's there until you see with some clarity that it's, that it's there. So I getting ready for this uh, sermon and for 2019 and trying to lead you all in that direction and, and uh, offer some clarity and encourage you to buy whatever. So, uh, so I, I started uh, thinking through some of those things uh, in my own life about interaction with the scriptures. Well, the places where I thought that I was doing pretty well in relation to places where I thought I, I wasn't doing pretty well. And so I naturally found myself flocking to the places where I thought I was doing pretty well. And I, I, I thought through some of the very basic things about the Bible. I, I thought through the Ten Commandments. Well, I, I couldn't actually name you all of the Ten Commandments. I, I thought of the four that I could come up with. And one of them uh, is, the, is the commandment that, that I, shouldn't, I shouldn't lie. Maybe you're, maybe you're familiar with this commandment. Thou shalt not lie. I'm clear on that one, Ken. I don't know if I've got too much compromise going on there. I'm... I, Okay, I've lied. Maybe you've lied. I... So we used to live on one of these roads at the lake um, where our house did not have the internet. Maybe you live in a, a house like that or you have a lake house like that. And uh, not long ago, we, we uh, moved uh, to a place that does have the internet in our home. And it was this great step into the 1990s. And, and then... Um, and then we had Pastor Appreciation Month in October, and we had Pastor Appreciation. You guys uh, put some cards out in my, which was very nice. And so I was able to go, and, and for the first time, uh, we now have an Apple TV. So I'm sitting in my living room, uh, now more interested in watching previews on my Apple TV than I am interested in actually watching shows uh, on my Apple TV. I stumbled across this one show that, as I was pushing preview and interact, I, it really caught my attention related to my thinking about clarity and confusion. And so I, I wanted to, so this was what I, I just thought I'd show it to you. I, here was what I saw. Watch, watch this, watch this uh, thing here. When I lied on the application, I just thought I was doing what was in the best interest of my daughters. I knew that what I had done is wrong. You know, I wasn't the partier. I wasn't the bad girl. I was a liar. I just didn't think I was gonna get caught. I mean, it destroyed my life, to be honest with you. 
How many people here have lied at least once since the beginning of 2014? <laughs> how many people here think of yourself as honest, wonderful people? The same group. How can it be that at the same time we think of ourselves as honest and then we recognize that we're dishonest? When we started looking at dishonesty, my colleagues and I thought this was just another example of human irrationality. But all of a sudden, the world was telling us this is actually a more important topic to study. I have never doped. We don't torture people. Does the NSA collect any data on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? Not wittingly. In order to study dishonesty, we need to measure the extent to which people are dishonest. We've ran these experiments on almost 40,000 people. Dishonesty is contagious. Once you lie, you're more likely to lie again. And the bigger the brain, the larger the capacity to lie. Insider trading information is passed around. If it's not daily, it's weekly. Everyone's trading on this stuff. There wasn't one person in my office that wasn't. Being an NBA referee, I knew certain teams were going to be at an advantage or a disadvantage. And it was just a situation where I crossed a line that I shouldn't have been near. I think that even when you know it's wrong, the immediate gratification suffocates what you know is right. It's not about being bad. It's about being human. So I pushed purchase. I, I bought that for $10. I bought that show. It's an hour and a half long. If you're looking for a great assignment for your afternoon today, under the heading of thou shalt not lie. And you're sitting there thinking to yourself, I'm probably okay on that one. I want you to know that was how I went into the show thinking that I was okay on that one. I bought the show because a number of the stories that they showed there in the, in the publicity clip there, I know some of those stories. The referee that was point shaving in the event. I know that story. I don't know the story, but I'm, I'm interested. I heard about that when that happened. I'd be interested in watching that. I, I, I knew about Ashley Madison. I've seen Lance Armstrong. I insider trading. I, all right, I'm interested to hear these stories. So here's, here's, uh, here's how they do it. So I, I'll go ahead and play along with uh, Dr. Uh, Ariely's uh, experiment. So here we are, 2018. We're uh, almost to December 2000. So how many of you in 2018 have lied? Uh, yeah, it's okay. All right. So. How many of you have a view of yourself that you're a relatively honest, good person. Hands free. Ah. And again, it happened. The same hand. How is it that we're able to do that? How is it that you are able to be dishonest but still see yourself as an honest, good person? How do you do that? And through all their research, what they came up with is that we all create between our dishonesty and our high view of ourselves, we create in the middle there, this great language that they use, they call it the fudge factor. We all have a fudge factor that we use to sort of negotiate our way through that gap between our dishonesty and our high view of ourselves. And the fudge factor has many different elements and expressions. Here are the ones that they study and explore in the video. Everybody is doing it. Lie, cheat, steal, compromise. Everybody's doing it. You have a conflict of interest. I don't know how my telling this lie or cheating in this way is hurting anyone. Well, that lie wasn't about me. That lie was for other people. You're lying for other people. You're protecting other people. You're caring about other people. They do an interesting study related to creativity, the relationship between creativity and deception. Because every time you lie, you're being creative. You're making something up. 
And so they did a whole batch of studies on how when your creativity is primed, you're actually substantially more deceptive. Fascinating batch of the fudge factor. A lack of supervision. Turn us into liars, cheaters, thieves, quicker than anything else. Social norms. Fatigue. Distance from the crime. Um, Self-deception. They studied all those. All right. So to blow the ending for you. They go to UCLA. Not Oral Roberts. Not Liberty. Not Belmont. Not Wheaton. UCLA. They pull 500 students into a room, UCLA, and they're going to run this honesty test framework that they use in a, all these other settings. And what they do with these 500 UCLA kids is they say to them, okay, before we dive into what we're going to dive into, what we want you guys to do <coughs> on this sheet of paper that we've given you is we want you to write down, best you can remember, the Ten Commandments. Go. How many of the 500 UCLA students do you think wrote down the Ten Commandments? None of them. Nobody got all ten correctly. Uh, they, they made up some new commandments, which were pretty fascinating, they said. But uh, nobody got all, all ten of them uh, correct. Um, they finished up the writing of the Ten Commandments. They handed those in. They gave the tests to the 500 UCLA students and they said, do this test that they have used in at least 50 different countries around the world where those tests have graded the same level of dishonesty across cultures around the world. So Americans are not more dishonest than the French, than the British, than the Russians, than the Norwegians, same level of dishonesty all around the world with their tests. They give these tests to those 500 UCLA kids, and how many of them cheated five minutes after writing down the Ten Commandments? And the answer is none of them. Not one of them cheated. Now, why would that be? They weren't all Christians. In fact, then they went and did the test on some people who claimed to be atheists. Same thing happened. No one cheated. What they came up with is the reason as to why that was the case is because when you take your life and you tether it to something that has great value and great clarity and a substantial kind of moral code to it, it turns out that dramatically lowers your willingness I mean, I watched that show thinking that I was just going to kind of get some background info on how all those people were liars. And I'm telling you, the more I watched that show, the more I had to face what a liar I am. Psalm 119 says, how does a young man keep his way pure? I've hidden your word in my heart that 
might not sin against thee. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Paul says, I've taken every thought captive against anything that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God. do this for a living, interacting with the Bible. And, and not only that, I followed and loved the Lord long before you guys ever paid me to do it. And I was still caught off guard by how much compromise there was. And I interact with the Bible all the time. And y'all don't. And when I say y'all don't, what I mean by that is over the course of my 12 years here, we've taken three extensive surveys of our congregation. In those surveys, you all have given indications at some length about how much you interact with the Bible. And over the course of our, my 12 years here and those three things, the three times we took those surveys our congregation never scored higher than 9% of our congregation reading their Bibles on a daily basis. The number was never higher over my 12 years here, has never been higher than 9%. I mean, you'd think if you took our staff, our spouses, our elders, and their spouses, and knocked them into the room, you'd think we'd get over 10%. You'd think. One year we took it, the number was 6%. 6% of our congregation reading the Bible every day. Uh, so when, we were, when you ask a question on there about who loves the Bible, who believes the Bible, I want you to know we scored strong there. But when it came to the point of actually reading the Bible, and my suspicion is that the lists I did at the beginning are probably lists that we've bumped into we don't know what to do with the Old Testament we don't know what to do with the New Testament and it's not like that, uh, that information isn't available to you that information is more available to you than any time, any place, anywhere in the rest of the country you know there's more to look at on the internet than Facebook and day trading you could, like there are horrible sites out there that teach you terrible things about the Bible. Sites I wouldn't recommend that you even give the time of day. But there are some great sites out there that can give you some extraordinary insight on the Bible, and you actually can learn. Did you know this about yourself? You're very smart people. When you want to learn things, it's amazing the things you can learn. You actually could learn the story of the history of the children of Israel, and it wouldn't take you all that long to do it. You can go and find sites, and they'll tell you exactly what Bibles, what books of the Bible fall into what part of the story. They'll tell you all that. You, you can go to some, it's three clicks of a button in order for you to do it, and I don't mean to meddle. You just got to turn off the bachelorette to get there. That's it. You know, because you're busy. Yeah, you got to do that. All right. So here's what we're going to do in 2019. I feel everybody cringing already. Here's what we're going to do. Over the course of uh, my time here, I've, I've had the good fortune of, of uh, working with LaDonna Beckmeyer, our children's pastor. And what we instituted 12 years ago here is what we call the doc store. Now, you may not know what the doc store is, but if you have children who are uh, old enough to have ever been back with Miss LaDonna in the, in the back room, uh, the doc store is this really cool thing that we, we, the way we're doing it now, we open it up every fifth Sunday. And so when your kids come and you drop them off back there, they get what we call doc dollars. They get dollars for showing up. They get dollars for bringing their Bibles. They get, they get uh, doc dollars for bringing their friends. They get dollars for answering questions. They get doc dollars. The loud ones get doc dollars for being quiet. The quiet ones get doc dollars for talking. We print 
money back there, and we just give it away. And then what Miss LaDonna does with a team of some other folks here at the church is they just keep their eyes peeled for deals all around town and on the internet. And when there's a deal somewhere, so they'll buy footballs or basketballs or, or backpacks or uh, all they get all candy, all kinds of stuff, 50, 75, 85% off, and then they put it back in there, and they hang dock dollar price tags on those things, and then on the fifth Sunday, that's why your kids badger you so much to come on dock Sunday, because when the store is open, we got a room back there, that's a, it's a whole store filled with stuff, so that your kids can take those dollars, 10, 20, 50, 100, 200 dollars that they've accumulated over showing up and reading their Bibles and bringing their friends and and talking when they should be quiet and quiet when they should be talking. We had, uh, they bribe them for everything, man, and they love it. And they walk in there and then they go home with silly putty and 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 uh, twelve years over the course of the same twelve years. We've tried a number of different things with the grown-ups here in the room to to try to get you guys to read your Bible. We've done challenges, we've done reading plans, we've we've pointed posters, we've 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 printed t-shirts, we've done we've done all different kinds of things and and uh there's been kind of a over the years there's been kind of a strong start at different points, uh, but uh, other times not so much a strong start and then uh eventually things kind of, you know, uh, peter out somewhere around uh the middle of January. And then when that happens, um uh, then we're just sending you annoying things on your on your cell phones that you were kind of done with a, a while back ago, and so um, so now I've been here long enough. Maybe I don't know. You know, just the older you get, you just kind of get a little less. So uh, so here's my idea, and I don't know. That this isn't the title we're going to use for a variety of reasons. This is a bad title. But what we're going to do, starting in in 2019, January 2019, we're going to start. We're not going to call it an adult book uh, doc store. That seems wrong to call an adult doc store, but some, we're going to call it something for grown-ups. We're going to have a doc store for you. We've had four staff meetings, four long ones, about how we're going to give prizes to you good people. We've thought about how we can reward you for being on time, because frankly, you stink at it. <laughs> How's this? We getting along okay today? And Lord, thank you for Pastor Ken. Amen. Amen. Um, but the non-negotiable on the list is, is you reading your Bibles. So I thought to myself, well, maybe they just don't have a Bible, or maybe they need a new Bible, whatever. So, the last couple of months, I've been out there buying new Bibles for you good people to buy. This, this is one that, that I've uh, purchased for right out there in the, uh, by the Following Jesus Today uh, sign on the wall. We've got all different kinds of Bibles out there, nice ones. I mean, nice ones at stupid, crazy deals. Nobody's getting ripped off here. This is a $150 Bible set for 35 bucks. This is a reader's Bible. Do you all know what a reader's Bible is? A reader's Bible has no numbers in it. Every Bible you have has got chapter number or verse numbers. or they got little headings. God creates. Uh, Satan comes in the fall. Uh, the curses. That, that's Genesis chapters 1 through 2. You see those kind of black headings. This has no headings. This has no numbers. Genesis. And then you just read, and you don't even know where you are. It's a reader's Bible. $150. 35 bucks. The other three that I bought, they're already gone. This one I had on the front end, right there. We can only take cash today. This is a cash deal. I mean, we don't have any debit machines out there yet. So if you need to, okay. And if you uh, want to take one on the honor system, that's probably given the video a bad idea. And then in 2019, out there in that little area, I'm going to set up a, a dock store for you. If you read your Bible, you get a prize. And we're using the honor system. Okay. So like if you say, I want to read the Gospels, uh, 
then you come up and you say, hey, yeah, since the last time I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I'm going to have a prize out there. A prize like you get a gift card to go to Lil Rizzo's for lunch. I don't what I want to do, is everybody listening carefully? I, got, I haven't got this passed yet. This is just Pastor Ken shooting off at the mouth for stuff that's probably overselling and I'm going to under, I'm probably overselling and under delivering. But here's what I want to do. If, if we get all the way to the end of 2019 and you read your Bible all the way through Leviticus, Numbers, Haggai, the maps, you read it all. You say you read it all? Like I, I'll give you a, a day at Spa Shiki. I'll let you walk into the sunglass hut and get whatever pair of glasses you want, and O Hills will pay for it. Can he do that with our tithes and offerings? Well, I, I don't know if I can. <laughs> I don't like the sound of this, Ken. This just sounds wrong. You shouldn't reward Christian people for doing what they should be doing anyway. You're going to use our tithes offering like, let me just say this before you get too nervous about that. Uh, based on the statistics of the last 12 years, <laughs> like I ain't saying I'm betting against you, but I'm just saying. I'm not sure I got too many trips to Spa Shiki that I'm staring at here. <laughs> Come on. So, Ken, what are we going to do if we've got 100 people who come to the end of next year and we've all read our Bibles? Are you really going to let them go in for a $300 pair of glasses? $300 times 100 people? That, <laughs> okay, I want to say this, letter one. How fun would that business meeting be? And letter two, how does that in the meeting not include something that goes like, we had a hundred people in our church read their Bible. We've been doing this with kids for 12 years. I don't know, Ken, I just, that feels off to me. So here's what we'll do. Let's make this deal. Uh, you read your Bible and you focus your attention on reading your Bible, discovering in it what the Lord shows you, obeying the words that you see in the Bible through his commands, through the Lord Jesus. You worry about that part. And I will worry about standing before the Lord over the church that I pastor and facing what judgments the Lord may have for me about how I'm trying to motivate his good people to read the Bible that they believe and love but don't interact with to the degree they could or should which is leading to all different levels of compromise in our lives compromise sneaking up on you like a sweet old lady on a motorized cart and you don't even see it coming because you've clicked it off to love forgiveness how dare you judge and I'll go to heaven when I die And you, however, 
you know all about my teaching and my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance, my persecutions and sufferings. You know what kinds of things happened to me in Eldon, in Jefferson City, and Omaha, and the persecutions that I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of that. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Did you know that? This is 2 Timothy chapter 3. while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. For all scripture is breathed out of the mouth of God himself. And it is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that good people like you could be equipped by God for every good work that he has for you to do, that he prepared for you to do before the foundations of the world. This is not an easy assignment that I'm laying before you this year. little homework that you probably have to do. And not all of you will do it. And all of you are, in fact, loved by God. But I'm banking that some of you will. And that those of you who do will find your lives changed as you come to encounter the God of the universe in the words that he offered and revealed about himself as he talks to you not only about who he is but about who you are and who you aren't and what you have and what you don't and the challenges that are in front of you and the challenges that he will walk you through and when you come to see his word in that kind of way not because some guy like me told you but because you've interacted with it on your own telling you. That's the kind of stuff that changes people's life. And if alongside that change we'd send you for wings to the Rizzo's, how is that a bad thing? All right. So let me pray for us. Father, for those here that have known you a long time, who've stared at parts of your word with anxiety and nervousness, unsure, embarrassed, thinking by now they should or ought or need to be somewhere other than where they are. I, I pray, God, in these days at our church, in these days in their life, you would deliver them from such pride. You would help them to embrace the humility that comes with learning and interacting with information that if they learned it they would only love you all the more Father for those that are novices in the room I pray that you would energize them over the next few weeks as we ramp to the first of the year uh, to lean into possibility of reading the Bible, interacting with it, changing their lives. And I pray
pray for those in the room, Lord, who read your word every day. May they be a model to us. May they be a challenge to us. May they be accessible and gracious.